welcome to this presentation of the Rotary Club of North Bethesda, Maryland, USA. Our club was established in 1974. We meet every Friday morning at 7.45 a.m. and we often invite guest speakers to give presentations on all kinds of interesting subjects. Please contact us through our website at nbrotary.org. And thanks for watching. Our speaker today is Keith Peterman. Keith is Professor of Chemistry Emeritus from York College in Pennsylvania. He takes a student group to Costa Rica each year to investigate evidences of climate change. He will share some things they have learned. Um, I'm happy to introduce Keith Peterman, who served as a professor of chemistry at York College of Pennsylvania for more than four decades, retiring in May 2020. He has served as a Fulbright Scholar in Germany and in Russia, a National Academy of Sciences Scholar in Poland, a research fellow at the Naval Research Lab in DC, and a visiting scholar in China and New Zealand. He's a member of the American Chemical Society Committee on Environmental Improvement. He takes a student group to Costa Rica each year to investigate climate, climate change issues linked to impacts, adaptation, and mitigation. He participates in the annual United Nations Climate Conferences as an accredited member of the press. His current research and writing focus on issues related to climate change and sustainability. His book with his co-author, Matt Cordes, The Overstory of Climate Change in the Anthropocene, is scheduled for release in spring 2021. <laughs> he is the recipient of the 2020 ACS CEI Award for Incorporating Sustainability into Chemical Education. And I am very, very happy that he agreed to speak with us because he's a delightful person with lots of knowledge, and uh, I know we'll enjoy it. Go ahead, Keith. Okay, well, thank you, Linda, for the introduction, and uh, I'll say thank you, Nick, for for uh, your comments on truth before, because it <clears throat> fits right into what I'm going to be talking about today, and thanks to the Rotarians for inviting me. So what I'm going to do today is take us on a on a journey. I think we've all been locked up in Zoom for so long. We're going to go on a journey to Costa Rica and use it as a lens for trying to look at issues of climate change and sustainability. Just to locate us, I think, I'm not sure if your name is correct here, Lasse, L-A-S-S-E. -S -S -E. I saw you had a big map back in the corner there, so <laughs> all you need to do is look around behind you and we can locate Costa Rica sandwiched between Nicaragua and Panama. It's a tiny little country but uh, geographically, but even within that, we're just going to uh, cover a very small small portion of it. You can see right here and try to look at some, some impacts and adaptation uh, linked to climate change. So uh, our journey, first of all, we're gonna land in the uh, San Jose uh, airport in the Central Valley. If you follow, uh, we'll take a trip up over the mountains and drop down into uh, Arenal Volcano. You see the village of La Fortuna. If you can follow around that lake, we will circumnavigate the lake and end up in Monteverde at the Monteverde Cloud Forest. And then we'll drop off the mountain, uh, take a uh, cross the, uh, the Gulf and end up at Cabo Blanca Nature Reserve. Even though this is a small area, it is a, our journey is gonna take us into uh, three different ecological zones. It's rainforest region to the east of the mountains. On the mountaintop, it's a cloud forest region and uh, we'll end up in a dry coastal forest region. And then I'm going to end my discussion today by talking somewhat about uh, ecosystem services. So to give you an idea why we have these different ecological zones, uh, this graphic will help somewhat. The north trade winds sweep, or the northeast trade winds sweep, sweep across the Atlantic uh, and across the Caribbean. That, that warm, moist air strikes the mountains. The uplifting air expands, it cools, and it drops uh, rain on the eastern side of the mountains, which creates, creates an, a rainforest region there. Uh, the air still has a fair amount of moisture and it leaves a cloud deck on the mountaintop, which creates a, uh, a uh, uh, 
a cloud forest region, which is very rich in, in uh, diversity, and then it dissipates and uh, leaves dry air on the Pacific side. And that, in, uh, on the Pacific side, that's dry for uh, nine months out of the year. So I'd like you to join, join my, a student group to make this journey. I will hop aboard a microbus and enter the rainforest region. And here is the village of La Fortuna. I hope this, this uh, image gives you an idea of how lush and green it is. There's Arenal Volcano in the background, but we're gonna stay not on the front side of the volcano, which is lush and green, but we'll go to the back side of the volcano, which is uh, scorched and barren due to the volcanic activity is primarily on this side of the volcano. And our hotel is Hotel Linda Vista. Linda Vista meaning splendid view or beautiful view. And indeed it is a beautiful view. Here's a picture of Arenal Volcano I took about uh, a little over a decade ago. You can see the steam plume coming off to the left, a pyroclastic blast to the right, that gray cloud, that <coughs> loud boom. If you had binoculars in hand, you could, you could uh, see boulders coming down the side of the mountain. Uh, if it was nighttime, you'd see red hot boulders uh, splintering and streamlets of glowing lava coming down the side of the side of the mountain. It's quite mes mesmerizing. Uh, the volcano has actually been resting since 2010, not sleeping. It's still a very active volcano. It was the 16th most active volcano in the world. Uh, unknown to villagers, it was a volcano. Uh, it, it had been a. It was just a mountain, but they, they didn't realize it was a volcano that averaged an eruption about. Uh, once every 400 years, but then in 1968, it had, had a massive uh, eruption that entombed two villages and many villagers beneath. I take my students uh, to the volcano uh, to look at issues of plate tectonics, volcanic activity. Uh, we, uh, we have natural skies who talk about the geological formation of Costa Rica. And, uh, it, and, and that the Costa Rica sits on the, uh, on the ring of fire and the ring of fire is this horseshoe shaped belt of tectonic plates that uh, encircle the Pacific basin. It's 40,000 kilometer lo kilometers long. It lays claim to 75% of the world's volcanoes. Uh, in the evening after a long day in the field, we'll uh, immerse ourselves literally in geothermal energy and Tabacon hot springs. But what this brings us to, and the reason we visit the volcano is, is it brings us to the question of, uh, that I'm asking almost every climate talk I'm giving, with all the climate alarm alarmism, doesn't our climate just vary naturally anyway? And the answer to that is unequivocally yes, our climate does vary naturally. And volcanoes are a major contributor to that natural uh, radiative forcings. Here, here's on the other side of the Ring of Fire in the Philippines, the largest volcanic eruption of 20th, 20th century was Mount Pinatubo in 1991. Uh, what the volcanic eruptions do, including the 1968 eruption of Arenal Volcano, Mount Pinatubo and others, they blast not just boulders and rock into the uh, atmosphere, they, they fall out very quickly, but many other gases and debris. Sulfur dioxide is blasted into the stratosphere, where if you follow that equation across the top, it can be oxidized to sulfur trioxide, SO3, which reacts with water to form sulfuric acid, H2SO4, which contains sulfates, that SO4 unit, which create aerosols. Those aerosols re reflect sunlight causing a cooling effect, much like if you're laying on the beach on a hot summer day and a cloud comes over, it begins to cool. So volcanoes do in fact influence climate. However, they are episodic and they are transient. They cause a negative radiative forcing and that's just a fancy way of saying they cause a cooling effect. However, aerosols are short lived, lived and they'll cause this effect for about 12 to 14 months. In the case of Mount Pinatubo, it lasted for two years, the cooling from it. And of course the ash settles out uh, more rapidly than that. I could talk about other natural driving forces, but the key here is that natural drivers uh, all taken together do not explain late 20th century warming. The only way can, we can explain late 20th century warming is if we include human forcing along with natural forcing. Now, I'm going to uh, show, uh, talk briefly about uh, the greenhouse effect and then show three graphs and then we'll get back to our journey around Costa Rica. 
the idea of the greenhouse effect, is it good or is it bad? Well, the greenhouse effect is good. If it was not for the greenhouse effect, this would be a cold, lifeless rock that we live on. Uh, solar radiation powers our climate system. Our atmosphere contains three primary gases, N nitrogen, oxygen, and argon, none of which would help to warm the planet. But the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which stands at about 0.04% now, is what allows our planet to stay warm by converting the solar radiation through uh, uh, various mechanisms uh, into, a, uh, in, into heat for our planet. It is the enhanced greenhouse effect, which is of concern to us here. And I'm go going to show you, this is what I can, my colleagues and I consider the top 10 of all the graphs you should know about climate change. This is called the Keeling curve. Uh, Dave Keeling was a postdoc when he collected his first measurement of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere at 313 parts per million on Mauna Loa Observatory in, uh, in Hawaii. Since 1958, we can see for, has gone from 313. Uh, today, it stands at 417 parts per million. The pre-industrial concentration was less than 300 parts per million. Following this is a temperature change. On the left-hand side of the graph, you see a temperature anomaly. On the bottom, the year since uh, uh, 1880 is what we're looking at right here. The anomaly had, uh, indicates how much the temperature is above or below a given temperature. Let's look at 1960 as an average zero. We can see that since, uh, since uh, about 1970, the temperature has been increasing and 19 of the 20th warmest years on record have all occurred since 2001. The key is that humans are responsible for our current planetary fever. The last graph I'd like to look at is, well, what about paleoclimatological data? If we go back 800,000 years, this graph shows, if you look at uh, carbon dioxide in parts per million is to the right side of the graph, temperatures to the left, Carbon dioxide concentration is a blue line. Temperature is the light, is a dark blue. Temperature is a light blue line. We can see a correlation between the two. But the point to be made here is that in the past 800,000 years, carbon dioxide concentrations have never exceeded 300 parts per million. And once again, today they stand at 417 parts per million. With that background, I'd like to uh, now return to our journey in Costa Rica. We uh, don't just visit the volcano, we visit other sites around the volcano, one of which is, is a butterfly conservatory, and we do that to look at issues of sustainability. Time doesn't allow us to address those issues right now, but I would like you to introduce you to my two favorite butterflies. One is the blue morpho, which is the national butterfly of Costa Rica, and another is the glass wing butterfly, which we'll, we will even see in a cloud forest where we're headed now. So let's reboard our bus. We're going to head around Lake Arenal, make a brief stop at the, uh, at the Arenal Dam. That dam you see there was built from the boulders that were blasted out of Arenal Volcano in 1968. Costa Rica currently meets more than 99% of its electrical needs through geothermal energy. Of course, we immersed ourselves in that energy, experienced it in the hot, tub, hot, hot springs, hydroelectric power, and through wind turbines. Now we're gonna circumnavigate the lake. We'll head up into the Sabalito Hills. And I can tell you that over the uh, two decades I've been going to Costa Rica, uh, I've been seeing them build windmills every year. There's, there's dozens upon dozen more windmills. If you've never hugged a windmill, I encourage you to climb a fence, go over and give it a hug. And when you feel the power of the whoosh of those, those uh, turbine blades which are going around, it will give you a sense of just how much energy the wind can provide to be converted into electrical energy. From there, we're gonna head up into the cloud forest. Our accommodations are a little bit more uh, rustic here. We stay in uh, uh, cabin-like hotels and just up the road about 200 meters. I'd like you to see how the students are dressed even though they're in the tropics to head in for a, uh, a night in the forest. I will tell you, the, a night hike, uh, the forest at night looks, sounds, and feels much more, much different than it does during the day. Uh, as, you're, as you go in with naturalist guides, uh, the scorpion you may not be able to see during the day, but it does uh, fluoresce under a, uh, uh, under a UV light. We can tease out a tarantula. 
birds are just beginning to settle down on the ends of the branches. This blue crowned motmut is just about ready to go to sleep. And of course, there's others sitting there like the a side straight palm pit viper about to uh, grab its evening meal. In the morning, we're gonna head up into the Monteverde Cloud Forest, which is one of the most biologically diverse regions on the planet. And it is the most famous cloud forest in the, in the, uh, in the world. I'm going to focus uh, on the golden toad, uh, which lives on the mountaintop of Monte, the Monteverde Cloud Forest. It was discovered in 1964 by a young Quaker by the name of Jerry James, and it was documented in the literature two years later by Jay Savage. The golden toad lives on the, uh, its, its habitat is on the, uh, the continental divide uh, of Monteverde, about eight kilometers long and about a half kilometer over each side of the continental divide. Here you can see these, this is my favorite short hike in the world. You can see some students walk, walking right down the continental divide. Left hand picture, the ones on the right are looking east toward the Atlantic. They can't see the Atlantic Ocean, but it gives you a sense of the trade winds sweeping up. The rainforest is beneath them. They're now uh, up here in the clouds. The story of the golden toad is that it is, it is an endemic to this region, meaning it's found only on this eight kilometer uh, uh, length on top of the Monteverde cloud forest. When the spring rains would come in late April, they would emerge from the forest rubble. They would only be seen for about two months out of the year. The males were golden. Well, if you've ever picked up a toad, you know a toad is not golden, but rather it's more of an oliver uh, color. Uh, the males are golden. You can see a male and female mating there on the right-hand side. The female looks more like a, look like a toad. They are sexually dimorphic, meaning they're, they differ in both their size and their appearance. Um, the, in 1987, there's a great amphibian crash in the Mount Tavari Cloud Forest where these golden toads would emerge by the thousands. Only 1,500 were observed in the study area. In 1988, only a single golden emer toad emerged from the forest rubble when the spring rains come looking for a mate. That never mate never arrived. In 1989, only a single golden toad emerged from the forest rubble. Uh, once again, looking for a mate. Uh, some believe that perhaps it was even the same golden toad. It has not been seen since. It's been declared extinct and declared extinct due to climate change. Uh, my friend, Dr. Alan Pounds uh, wrote the first, uh, wrote the seminal article which links the golden toad to species extinction. So the golden toad represents a first species extinction linked to climate change. But the situation becomes a bit more grave. In 2006, doc, six, Dr. Pounds and about a, uh, a dozen other researchers from Central and South America compiled their data together and they wrote an article in Nature which for the first time linked mass species extinction to climate change. Fully one third of the harlequin frogs in Central and South America have disappeared. Dr. Pounds quote states, lethal disease may be the bullet, but climate change is pulling the trigger. Lethal disease is a chytrid fungus on the, on the skin of the, um, of, the gold, of, of the frogs, but climate change is creating ideal conditions, warmer nights, cooler days that allows the chytrus fungus to survive. Dr. Pound- Excuse me, are they yeah. poisonous? Excuse me, are uh, they well, poisonous? Well, some of, the, some of the frogs, I'm not a biologist, but I, what, I, what, I, what I will say is that uh, some of the frogs are, are poisonous. And of course that, that, that color, uh, the color associated with uh, frogs frequently is a warning to predators, <laughs> like I'm brightly colored, uh, uh, the blue jeans frog, you know, some, some of these others, but uh, in terms of, you know, the harlequin frogs, I'm not sure what percentage of them would be poisonous. All right. Thank you. Okay. Anyway, Dr. Pounds uh, can show uh, multiple graphs and he does lots of statistical analysis and so forth. But what he, what he does say is that Monteverde basically mirrors what we're observing on the rest of the planet. It's getting hotter and colder and wetter and drier, meaning more hot days are being packed together, more cold days are being packed together. They have many, many wet days together and many dry days together. Of course, species don't adapt well to this. Well, we're finding this globally where we're having more torrential downpours as well as more uh, 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 greater droughts. Or basically our hy uh, hydrological cycle is changing. 
I'd like to also now take a look at another species. This is the resplendent cacel. If there's any birders in the group out there, I'm sure that this is one you would like to see. We see it almost every year we go to the uh, Monteverde. And its nesting zone is on the, uh, on, on the mountaintop. Uh, this picture was just taken in my most recent trip was March 2020. <laughs> I'm sorry, yeah, I'm looking last year and of course been locked down since. The resplendent cell is at risk. It's at risk because as conditions are changing on the mountaintop, it's getting, it's getting warmer. Uh, lower elevation species are moving upslope. Among those is the keel-billed toucan. Uh, uh, keel-billed toucans have been observed to, uh, well, they, they've been competing with the uh, resplendent cell for nesting zones. Uh, and for food sources as well, they've been observed uh, eating Kitzel eggs. When I first started going, I never saw a keel-billed toucan at Monteverde. Now you, now you see them. They're an example, not just of species redistribution due to climate change, but species encroachment, and they're putting the Kitzel at risk. Well, why doesn't the Kitzel move? It has no place else to go. It's already at the mountaintop. Oops. Uh, so let's drop off the mountaintop. Uh, head down to sea level, board a ferry, head across the, the Koya Gulf, end up at Pekera is this little port we're at, at going into right there. Oops, I'm pushing the wrong way. Now we'll end up in a dry coastal forest, forest region, uh, ending up at the funky little seaside village of Montezuma. And I will tell you, this is my favorite hotel in the world. It's called Hotel Amor de Mar. If any of you are looking for planning a trip, it's also my favorite breakfast in the world. But I'd like to divert for just a moment and go back and look at uh, uh, some early history of Costa Rica. It emerged as an independent nation following a bloody civil war in 1948. In, in, in the mid 20th century, nearly three quarters of Costa Rica was closed, cloaked in a lush forest. The new government encouraged citizens to develop the land and they would give ownership of that land uh, if, if they cleared it. Through the 1970s and 1980s, the rate of deforestation in Costa Rica was the highest in Latin America. By 1987, this lush Central American country had lost an estimated 30 to 50 percent of its forest cover. What they discovered is that resource consumption <coughs> was rapidly outpacing any preservation efforts. Now with that, I'm going to pop back to uh, Montezuma, where we just ended up that village, and go to the southern tip of the peninsula to what is currently called Cabo Blanca Absolute Nature Reserve. I deliberately put this picture in here because this is the same group of students who were dressed quite differently when they were up in, for the night hike in the, uh, in the mountain. And instead of that's my grandson sitting there in the front giving the two thumbs, thumbs up. <laughs> so this is a dry, uh, dry coastal region. Uh, a young Swede by the name of, um, uh, well, I'll just say a, a, a young Swede and his wife uh, arrived uh, in Costa Rica in the 1960s. He traveled to the uh, uh, southern tip of the peninsula and he was shocked by what he saw. The entire southern tip of the peninsula had been, been denuded based upon what the government, this idea of clearing the land and it belongs to you. He had been in search of native seeds. So what he did was he, uh, put forth an effort to try to bring this land back and through support of NGOs and, and some government support and so forth, he was able to uh, convert this southern tip into an absolute nature reserve, meaning it was allowed to just recover on its, no, on its own. That was 1963. This represents the first protected land in all of Costa Rica and also the first protected land in all of Central America. It was a bit of a turning point, but even, th even though Costa Ricans, some were beginning to preserve their land, as we already saw, the rate of deforestation was outpacing the rate of forestation. I can tell you that uh, this is what uh, Cabo Blanca looks like to today, instead of being pasture land, that is a recovering uh, secondary forest with uh, mud much fauna coming back like that uh, capuchin monkey in the lower right-hand corner, anteaters, and many, many more. So this brings us to the concept of uh, payments for ecosystem services. In the 19, late 1980s, Costa Rica was headed in the wrong direction. In the 1990s, they said that we need, we need to make some ra ra radical changes here. So in 1996, they passed legislation making it illegal to log any forest without the approval of authorities. 
1997, they introduced a novel payments for ecosystem services, which rewards farmers for implementing practices of sustainable forestry and environmental protection. They also passed a law in 2012 that, that, uh, uh, that banned uh, sport hunting. What ecosystem services are, and this is a, this is a developing uh, new term. In fact, the UN just last month passed accounting rules for ecosystem services, which will replace gross domestic product, but that's a little beyond our discussion right now. Basically what it says is humans draw a direct benefit from healthy ecosystems and from the beauty of the environment. And they include things like forest ecosystems, aquatic ecosystems, and, and others. Um, Basically, uh, well, in, in 2020, uh, just last year, Costa Rica received the UN Award for Global Action on Climate Change for their payments on ecosystem services for the idea of financing of climate-friendly investments. Now, this brings us to uh, uh, Costa Rica today. Today, 60% uh, of the country is covered in, in lush forests. And you probably know that many people visit it. It now hosts uh, 3 million visitors per year who drop $4 billion into their treasury. They don't, they don't do that for the purpose of harvesting their timber, but they do it for the purpose of getting a picture of a resplendent cell, maybe uh, seeing a uh, sloth in a treetop, looking at a, a red-eyed tree, uh, tree frog in, in, its, uh, in its native environment. Uh, the idea is that there's significant monetary value in nature just being nature. This is called natural capital. The concept is that nature is priceless, but it is not valueless. In summary, I'd, I'd simply like to say that Costa Rica has been a global leader in addressing climate change. I could give you many, many issues where they're addressing climate change. It's been very forward thinking in the way it values nature. And with that, I will say thanks for listening, as will my Howler Monkey friend here say it as well. I'd be glad to entertain, entertain any questions any of you may have. Uh, yeah, I had a question. I, you mentioned the uh, pandemic and, and the impact. Can you talk about the impact on tourism in Costa Rica? Because well, we, yeah. had a, we had a trip scheduled. It was completely canceled. We're still waiting to go. Yeah, that's correct. Actually, the data I took was from 2019. <laughs> and and the, uh, the pandemic in, in stuff I do, you know, when you look at the pandemic, uh, it was a third of that. Uh, their, 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 their visitations and a third of that for their income. Uh, but if you go to 2019 and go back uh, the years before, uh, that's where the, that's where the data came from. But a very, a very, very good point. Uh, in fact, I was scheduled to go to Costa Rica in, in March, uh, just ended and had to cancel my trip. They had opened up for the U.S., but uh, they were they were in the top 10 in the world in terms of uh, their situation concerning the pandemic. But when they opened up for tourism, it just, it's a little nation and it, uh, it, it became pretty bad. But they're, I think they're, they're coming back quite nicely. All right. Uh, Keith, of the time that you've been going there, what have you visually, uh, what has been most shocking to you, both in a positive way and in a, and in a alarming way? I mean, okay. I have. Well, first, should I unshare my screen here so I can see who we're looking at? The, yeah, uh, it's Linda. Yeah, I saw, I saw that. Oh, I, my shares have thought, stopped the share. And then I'll see, see what we have. I, I'd say in the positive sense, um, Costa Rica is very forward thinking in terms of their issues of sustainability. Uh, you know, I, I, I looked at those, uh, uh, the, the wind turbines when I first started going, you know, decade and a half or more before, almost two decades ago, we would have to take a, a big detour to go back over the hills to see the turbines. Now they're all along the Sobolito Hills. Uh, they're, they're very, very conscious, I, I would say, uh, the recovery, for example, recovery of Cabo Blanca, you know, I've been tramping through there for nearly two decades and, I, and I've actually seen the, the, the changes over the year, years. The negative, of course, is uh, it's a one-way trajectory. Uh, Dr. Pounds has been giving lectures uh, every year and I see, I see the data being, you know, year after year after year, he's collecting more and more data and we're seeing more dry days being packed together, more wet days being packed together. Uh, uh, that, that's a negative. 
uh, on the positive, Costa Rica, uh, I drink I drink a, a coffee, and I was going to present that here, but <laughs> time just doesn't permit, but it comes from uh, uh, um, central Costa Rica. Uh, they they are the, uh, uh, were the first carbon neutral coffee cooperative in the world. They, they achieved that goal in 2011. I had actually visited this coffee cooperative in 2010, and they achieved it the following, following year. So not only are the coffee is... Uh, that cooperative uh, carbon neutral, but many others are now carbon neutral, as well as some banana plantations and others. So Costa Rica is making a concerted effort to move toward a zero carbon uh, nation. Uh, the United States has pledged to move toward a, a uh, uh, zero carbon, I'm, I'm sorry, carbon neutral, not zero carbon, but we have not yet uh, acted on that pledge. Hopefully that will be the case. I mean. Hopefully that answers some of your questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Yes. Uh, uh, Keith, this is Bob Sonomani. I visited Costa Rica at least twice, and it's one of the most beautiful countries I ever visited in my life. My question is about the toucan, you know, one of the national bird. You can, uh, I mean, very hard time to see the toucan as we travel from the east to west, from the uh, turtle beach on the, on the east, and all the way to the, uh, you know, to the uh, volcano, to the, you know, in that area from all the way across the country. And the toucan is getting rare and rare. What is the status of the toucan in terms of the species uh, in Costa Rica? That's, that's one of the biggest attractions. A lot of people talk about the Costa Rica and toucan. Okay, actually, I, the, uh, if you look at the Caribbean side, I, I am a little bit less familiar with the Caribbean side and what might be happening there. I'm not knowledgeable about the status of the toucan. Mm -hmm. uh, what I can say is, I mean, I, I see them and I've never heard any of our nationalist guides and, and they're, they're very good. None of them have ever actually even addressed the toucan. Mm -hmm. I, I, th I think they're more focused on some of the other more vulnerable species. Uh, but what I can say is if they're running out of land in the lower elevations, we can see that they're moving up and the naturalists see it. And, you know, I've seen it myself but uh, of course, the data is also showing how lowlands, not just two two cans, but bats are redistributing, and uh, you know, many, many species are undergoing redistribution. One of the most fascinating thing I have seen is the Turtle Beach. I don't know the uh, I can't uh, you know the Spanish name, but it's the uh, this was in sometime in before end of December. Or we were there at the time, you know. Uh, and so I've seen so many turtles on the beach. I've never seen anywhere else emerging, you know, on the turtle beach. Hundreds <laughs> it's and hundreds. Yeah, it's interesting you bring that up. I've been going to Montezuma since 2003. Okay. And, and, I, and I've been there every year and sometimes multiple times a year. When I first started going, uh, it was not known that the olive ridley turtle nested all along Montezuma Beach and all the beaches going beyond that that people don't go to. Uh, it, and I, I met the guy who actually started an NGO. So this is a little bit of answer to Linda's question. You know, it's the nonprofits that are protecting. Mm. So he started an NGO to start protecting these olive ridley turtles. The natives, I mean, many of the, the locals used to dig up the turtle eggs when they come. Uh, and of course, many people didn't even know they were there and they would eat them and they would then be taken to San Jose because like many other things in the world, many thought they were aphrodisiacs mm. and you know, things of that nature. But now they're protected. And in Montezuma during the nesting season, which goes from about November until about uh, uh, January, but then till they're hatching until the beginning of March around that time. And I've seen the turtles released and it's such an endearing, endearing sight. Mm. They don't really do it the way they should, like they should let them come up naturally, but they'll dig up the turtle eggs, put them in a hatchery, and then at the, uh, the, they come up naturally and then they'll save them and release them at a certain time of the day. I know that they should let them go out on their own, but nevertheless, uh, they're collecting data on that. It'll be a few more years before you know, because in, typically only one in a thousand would survive. And now it may be, we'll see, because they have to let them go across the beach to create their memory, to come back to the same place. And in some years, some soon years, we should start getting some data about how many more are coming back to that area. But turtles are just, I, I love them. <laughs> the other thing which I noticed on the Western side of the uh, Costa Rica, there's a lot of Americans that settled down there. Mm -hmm. 
uh, actually, one time we were thinking of retiring in Costa Rica. A lot of Americans <laughs> retire. They say the cost of living is so great. I mean, it's, you know, it's low. And yeah, that, life is just absolutely beautiful. A lot of, it, it, lot of people it, have, it, know, retire it, there. It's a beautiful life. And, and many, many gringos have settled. And the, and the western coast, the re when I talk about this dry coastal region, mm -hmm. uh, it's a great, it's world-class surfing. And yeah. uh, it's a great place to live. You're guaranteed, if you, li if you like warm, dry weather, you're guaranteed, not maybe will it warm and dry, be dry. But if you, want a, if you want a sunny vacation, you will get a sunny vacation. You go am I correct that this is the only country that doesn't have an army, or uh, no uh, defense yeah. department? They do not have an army. And that's the reason the young Quaker, Jerry James, who found the, uh, who discovered the Golden Toad. Uh, I'd love to talk about Wolf Winden, <laughs> one of the original Quakers. But uh, the reason they settled there is because there was not, they did not have a standing army. And basically, a very brief story, story is Wolf Winden and, and his wife. Uh, uh, well, Wolf was found guilty. Uh, he and two cousins were supposed to uh, be drafted in the army for the Korean War. They refused to draft the Quakers. They were found guilty and sentenced to a year and one day in jail. That extra day meant they lost their civil liberties, couldn't even vote. Uh, the judge told them basically if they can't obey the laws of America, get out. So they decided, well, get out. Well, where do you go? In 1950, 51, 52, they looked and Costa Rica had abolished, they, after that bloody civil war, they abolished their army and being pacifists, they decided to settle in Costa Rica. So there's quite a Quaker presence in Costa Rica. And in Monteverde, they almost split but because of the Quaker faith and the way they do things, they all settled in Monteverde. And then we get into the story that Wolf Gwinden was the first chainsaw salesman, but uh, <laughs> so he was part of this deforestation where the forest is used for lumber and they need lumber, they need pasture. It is, you know, it's the material, the, the, the material value, which gets right to the heart of the talk. Later, you know, in 1970, he, he discovered the folly of his ways and how it didn't match with, with the Quaker faith. And then he and others helped preserve the mountaintop of Monteverde to what it is today. And now they're, 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 they're getting much more from the natural capital, capital Monteverde than he would from a few trees. So- May I ask a question <laughs> about uh, the climate change? Yes. We're all trying to do our part to um, uh, stop uh, the uh, destruction that we're all concerned about. Now, a, a few weeks ago, we had a, a talk here at Rotary on climate change, and I got a piece of information that I'm unsure whether it's correct or not, and maybe you can comment on it. All right. That is the, the point that was made, and I think I got this right. I asked twice about it, that um, there's, a, as you pointed out in your talk, there is a lot of, shall we call it, natural pollution. We have huge forest fires. We have right. volcanic eruptions, and there are other sources of pollution. And what our speaker said was to me very disappointing. And he said that that pollution accounts for about 75% of the pollution that's relevant. So that when we're talking about making our contribution, we're working on 25%. Very disappointing if that is the case. Can you comment? Yeah, I, I, you know, it's hard to talk kind of about comment about statistics, and you have to see what statistics a person is saying. And if they're saying pollution, and if pollution is to, to include okay. things like the forever chemicals, the fluorinated chemicals, well, that we account for one hundred percent of that pollution because that's not that you know. Uh, uh, but but uh, you're saying natural pollution, and I I would have to look at look at where they're getting the data because what I can say is that we do know currently that the CO2 that's going into the atmosphere is human, it comes from humans. We can do that based upon isotopic ratios and so forth, and, uh, and we have copious amounts of data. So uh, I, I, I would call that, I would have to say that is, that is suspect, but uh, also I'd have to say when, the, when, when he's using that statistic, what is, what is he actually talking about in terms of pollution? Because pollution is a very, is quite a broad term. Uh, and, you know, humans, if, if you talk about plastics, uh, plastics going into the ocean, we look at CO2 going into the atmosphere, but we have all these ecosystems. Plastics going into the ocean 
the projections are that, that the mass of plastics in the ocean will outweigh the mass of sea life by 2050 at, a, a, at the current scenario. And of course, we're trying to, trying to address that. That is not natural. <laughs> plastics are all human made. Uh, so, so again, I, I, I'd have to say, where, where are you getting your statistic? <laughs> And incidentally, for any research I ever do, I always like to try to go back to the original resources, not not the the newspaper article or anything like that, because many times it is not quite the way it's been restated. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Please, please. Well, I'm not. I'm the opposite of an expert on this. I was just trying to check on what the previous speaker had to say about uh, our contribution to the uh, bad parts of climate change. I would say to the bad parts of cont contribution, we are responsible. And, and I won't even say the, the literature, uh, the, the proper media tends to say 97% of scientists, it's not 97%. I have not read any reputable article or in every, sing every single major uh, scientific uh, organization in the world, including, you know, I'm going to go into the American Medical Association, the American Medical Society and others all have very powerful climate change, public policy statements, every single one. And they all state that humans are responsible for current uh, warming, uh, you know, and. So the, the volcanic eruptions and the forest fires, et cetera, have no a part in causing no. climate change? They, they do have a part in causing climate change. And of course, the volcanic eruptions are, are just episodic. A big one, I had to take this out of talk with something like solar variation. Thing, uh, uh, solar va variations are a major contributor to climate uh, change. In fact, they're called uh, Milanko Milankovitch cycles. And it is the earth travels around the sun in not a circle, but an ellipse. It also has a tilt and it precesses like a top. Well, that, that goes through, the, the ellipse is not constant. It goes through cycles. The, the, the precession goes through cycles and the, uh, the tilt goes through cycles. And those cycles converge to, uh, uh, they, 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 they converge and they can be calculated. And the, those solar variations have driven the ice ages. So, so, I mean, that's a huge factor when you look at the convergence of solar cycles to drive the ice ages. The key here is that we will not enter another ice age for another 30,000 years. And I might note that that's still the, the idea that the planet's entering a new ice age is still out in the blogosphere from a, an article way back, I think night, Newsweek cover about 1975 or 74, something like that. And a scientist was misquoted, but they don't die. <laughs> So, so, you know, you can look and say, well, scientists don't know. Some say we're going to do some say we're, uh, no, we're not, we're, we're, we're headed in the direction of an ice age based upon Milankovitch cycles, but it's like standing on the edge of a cliff and the tide's going to come in, but you see the rocks below, so I'm going to die because I know the tide's coming in. They're not even in the same time frame. So, all right. <laughs> Well, thank you. I, I just have a comment here, Clays. Uh, I think you said pollution. Pollution with about 100,000, about 80 to 90,000 chemicals in the environment. And the major contributor contribution is the CO2, uh, production of CO2 through the fossil fuels. That is the major contribution of the human activity in the climate chain. And the others, that less than 5% of the uh, contribution is the so-called ozone, depleting substances. So I think pollution is not the right word. I would say right. there are certain activity, human activities contribute, contribute to the increase in CO2 production, which has an effect on the climate change. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, thank you, um, Keith, for, um, for your presentation. That was wonderful. 